Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, uh, Smart Adaptation, How Microgrids Can Aid in Campus Disaster Planning and Energy Management. My name is Sarah Brylinski. I'm the Director of Climate Resilience and Educational Programs at Second Nature. And Second Nature is the lead supporting organization for the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. Glad to have you all here with us this afternoon. We have a really excellent group of panelists from Honeywell and a couple of different institutions to talk about their experiences with microgrids and some thoughts about planning, climate adaptation, and energy management. Before we get started, I just wanted to cover a couple of quick logistics. Uh, we'll, we'll be saving the question and answer period until the very end. So if you have questions for any of the individual panelists or questions about the topic in general, you can submit those at any time using the GoToWebinar chat function, question function. And if you're having any technical difficulties, you can submit those there as well. We'll help you out as we go along. If you have a question for a specific presenter, just make sure you include their name in your question so we can direct it appropriately at the end. And uh, in case you need to leave early or you're having difficulty with sound, we'll have both the PowerPoint presentation and a recording of today's webinar available after the event. So feel free to share that and visit it after we're done. So let's get started. Um, we have, as I said, a great lineup today. Um, I'm gonna turn it over in just a second to Kent Anson. Kent is Vice President of Complex Projects in Higher Education for Honeywell, and he's also a Second Nature board member. So we work with him quite closely, a great champion of the PCC and work that is able to be done on campuses. He'll be joined by his colleague, William Taylor, Director of Engineering at Honeywell. And then we have two presenters from uh, signatory campuses, Lowell Rasmussen, who's the Vice Chancellor for Facilities and Finance at University of Minnesota Morris, and Peter Strasis, uh, who's the AVP of Facilities Management at Western Michigan University, and who's also an APA board member. So Kent, why don't I turn it over to you to get us started? Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everybody. I'm uh, very enthusiastic about the opportunity to discuss microgrids today with the team. I feel that we've got a wonderful uh, audience signed up and also the presenters uh, that will allow us to see much of what's going on. Uh, you'll see, you've heard a little bit about the presenters and maybe I think Sarah the next page will get there. But if not, I just, I'll actually go back one if you could. But when I get to the, to the page of the presenters, we have Pete from Western Michigan University and Lowell Rasmussen from the University of Minnesota Morris. One thing that struck me thinking about these two as choices to be on the panel with us were that both of these schools have pre presidents and a chancellor that are very, very active in the, P the ACU PCC. Uh, Ch chancellor Jackie Johnson is, uh, you know, participates in the summits, uh, is very, very active on, on, on this topic, and you'll see that in Lowell's presentation, as is Dr. John Dunn from Western Michigan. So in our panel, we have two schools that are very, very much committed to the program, long-term members, and I think you'll see that. If you could flip the page then, please, to the question of are we ready? Uh, microgrids and the topic of are we ready is a huge discussion. Of, it's going on more and more today than ever before. The, uh, the damaging storms seem to be more frequent than ever. Uh, there's uh, more frequent and longer power outages. The, the one area in particular in Maryland, you know, six weeks of outages. There's been outages of, of great significance, certainly in the Gulf Coast, in Florida, and internationally. And so the storm activity clearly has been something that when you're a campus, you got to be thinking about. Then you add to that for some time the power distribution and reliability. If you think about the campuses that we're all part of, many of those campuses and most of those campuses were built at a time where there's a great deal of equipment that could be at the age where it might be failing. So when you add those two things together and then you look at the business impact, you could really ask the question, are we ready? In the case of the business impact for a school, it can be everything from your research projects to keeping your students in seats. Uh, many schools, tuition is a great driver for what you're bringing in. And if you had a catastrophic event, if you could keep the lights on in the school going, um, there are schools that are thinking about that. So today's presentation is really about answering the question, are we ready? Are you ready? Um, you'll find that schools are at all different stages here, but the answer is the technology is ready. And there are people that are ready, and through the stories you'll hear from Western Michigan, you'll hear from the University of Minnesota Morris, and from the campus of White Oak, which is the FDA headquarters, a site that's actually gone through 50 outages here recently and not had a blip on the screen, the answer is we are ready. So I look forward to the discussion. Uh, let's go. 
So this page really is just getting back to the teaser that you all saw for the for the seminar. And again, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's really all about discussing how energy reliability and how solutions such as microgrid can lessen the impact of future blackouts. And I mean lessen. I mean, this isn't intended to replace. When you think about adaptation, this is a word to me that clearly ought to be synonymous with adaptation being microgrids and the use of them on campuses. You heard the names of the panel members, but I'd like each of the panel members to introduce themselves here. Just briefly, my name is Kent Anson. I'm based in Exeter, New Hampshire. I cover the country for Honeywell in what's called our complex projects groups, getting the very, very complex projects, high-end energy solutions, and many of those tend to be higher education. You think about the needs of higher education, that's exactly where there are um, not only energy and environmental solutions we have, but also playing to the students and how we can help attract and retain students, we can help with curriculum, and we can attract, really become part of the marketing arm for the school. I also have a, a voluntary role as a second nature board member, which Sarah alluded to, and that's a great thing for someone like us to be part of. I learned so much by just being around uh, the other panel members, the other board members, and the, and the school presidents that, that allows me to really understand how to put solutions together that fit all of your needs and uh, welcome that opportunity and, and happy you've done that for the last couple of years. If I could go to Bill Taylor next to introduce himself. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bill Taylor, I'm Director of Engineering for Honeywell Building Solutions for the Energy and Environmental Solutions for North America and, and large parts of Latin America. Work with Kent quite a bit on, on university solutions and, and other complex projects across the Americas and very happy to be here so thank you very much for the opportunity. Now go to Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Strazis. I'm the Associate Vice President for Facilities uh, Management at Western Michigan University here in Kalamazoo. Uh, again, good morning for those on the West Coast and afternoon for the rest of you. I'm looking forward to uh, an active presentation here and hopefully some of the things we're doing at Western uh, are things that uh, can help some of you. And I'm also learning, hopefully, to learn something from others, too. Oh. Yes, and I'm Lowell Rasmussen. I'm Vice Chancellor of Finance and Facilities for the University of Minnesota Morris. Um, delighted to be involved with this conversation today, and we'll give you a little bit of a story of, uh, and it'll be a, a nice contrast from we're a small campus, and so you'll get to see uh, uh, what what a small campus is thinking about when it comes to sustainability and carbon management. Okay, so, so again, the webinar participants today, I don't know if we'll learn is the right word, but the real point is just to have a good discussion and get more knowledgeable on how others are thinking about microgrids. Uh, it's not just about allowing the campus to adapt to, the, to climate change, it's also about reducing greenhouse gas. We'll make a big point in the definition up front to clarify that. Um, you know, once the utility grid fails, you know, how does a microgrid allow the facility to run autonomously? Again, the White Oak facility, the example you'll see will be a, be a strong one of that, and you'll hear others from Pete and Lowell as well. And then how to evaluate the viability of a microgrid and how to look forward as to how you make those plans. So with that, if you can go to the next page, I'll go to Bill, and Bill's going to jump in on microgrid definition. Yeah, the, the microgrid definition in and of itself is, is pretty simple. It's, it's, we define it at Honeywell as the intelligent management of load, of local electrical power, generation supply and local electric loads. And you say, okay, well, that sounds pretty simple. I have a building, I have a campus in particular, I want to make sure that I don't lose power to that. I'm going to control that generation of power locally. I'm going to control how it's used locally with local control systems. And if the grid go, I'm going to monitor the grid. And if the grid goes down, my power is going to be the primary power source for that campus. So there are certain parts of this that, that are common to all microgrids. One is local power generation, that we want to coexist with the utility. Some microgrids will actually pull in a certain amount of, of power over the course of the day, over the course of the year. They'll sign up maybe 100 kilowatts they're going to draw in continuously. But as soon as the power goes out, as soon as the grid becomes unstable, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, you're going to switch to solely generated power locally on site or that you control specifically there that you can deal with. That's called islanding capability. The other part of that that goes with islanding capability is the ability to manage and control your local loads, and that's a big part of this. Now we go to the next slide, Sarah. I'm sorry. 
There are four basic steps that, that we'd like to take to a microgrid approach. One is the traditional efficiency improvements. Basically what we're doing there is limiting how much local generation we have to provide. So as you go through, you, you can make your building more energy efficient. You can go through the building management system and the HVAC and building envelopes, upgrades and, and the usual lighting retrofits. But what you're trying to accomplish is how much power do I have to generate when the local utility goes offline? You like to minimize that because that reduces your costs. On-site generation and storage, you're now going to generate, once you've become efficient, you want to generate just enough power, the amount of power to control the loads that you really are, that you consider critical. Whether those be classrooms, whether those be experimentations, whether those be dormitories, whatever part of that makes the most sense that you consider critical or what you're going to control, and you're going to drive the on-site generation and or storage capacity to do that. Gas turbines, diesel generators, power storage through thermal, electric batteries, renewable, um, photovoltaic, wind turbines, all that plays into how you wish to control the campus power generation in the event of a utility outage. Next one. Why do we want advanced controls? When you bring on the generation itself, you want to, it, you have to bring on the generation load up as you draw, begin to generate power. You have to bring on your loads to match. If you bring on too much load, your power will typically kick out and you get to start all over again. So you want to control your load. You want to bring up critical loads first, life safety loads first. What do I have to have to make the campus run safely? then I can bring up the rest of the campus. That requires advanced communication between the microgrid itself and each of your buildings and or your overall campus. And lastly, is you want to be able to operate the, the utility in with, you want to be able to operate the microgrid in conjunction with the utility grid or an island mode. Island mode means you're cut off, you're separated from the utility grid, you're fully operational as, a, as an island. You can also operate the utility grid. As you'll see, we'll talk a little bit about later, you can actually bring your generation equipment back online to help the grid stabilize on hot summer days, for example, and put demand back or, or put power back on the grid to help them out as well. So there's a lot of operational capabilities that you build into these controls based on your local utility, based on what you wish to accomplish, and based on what the utility wants to sign up for. So those are the four steps we typically go through. Next slide. Ah, and on to Lowell. Yes, thank you. And so what Morris is, has been thinking about is a renewable energy system infrastructure. And uh, next slide. Just a little bit about who Morris is. Uh, we are a part of the University of Minnesota. We are a small campus on the western part of the state of Minnesota. Um, I think you can read the, the bullet points there. Uh, we are a liberal arts, a public liberal arts campus and uh, have spent uh, a, a lot of time over the last 10 years thinking about sustainability, uh, policy, energy, environment. And so uh, what we have uh, essentially developed out of those processes is what we think is what might be a sustainable community or at least getting close to that. Next slide, please. The campus, uh, as noted, our chancellor is a signatory, and uh, we are committed to uh, being a demonstration site for what is possible in terms of renewable energy. Um, I, I, I won't go through these individually. The last point, uh, the first part of that is obviously an opinion, um, and but we are listed in the Princeton Review, and I think we'll be listed again. So. Um, people do notice. Uh, next slide. The concepts that we really started to think about was our location and how, how do we look at it strategically and what assets do we have. And I think the real key to this particular slide is understanding how the natural resource region could provide a roadmap to carbon management. Um, <clears throat> since we are a signatory of the President's climate commitment, uh, unless our investor-owned utilities and our energy suppliers already have their own carbon mitigation plans that would get us to zero, it really said, you know, we have to come up with some solutions on our own. And so that is why, and those two coincidental circles represent wind resources. The Moorablagan wind is wind, and 
today our wind resources. We are in a wind warning uh, area today uh, with excesses of 25 to 30 miles an hour. And I'll show you in a minute, uh, we definitely are off the grid today. Um, <clears throat> so we really looked at it and said we have to figure out what we can do with our natural resources that are available to us. And obviously uh, the, this slide portrays what would be uh, the natural conclusions of what we have in our area, and that is very adequate wind resources and, a, and a, certainly a great amount of biomass. Uh, this is my attempt at humor. Um, hopefully I won't offend anyone, but this is a cob harvester that we use uh, behind combines, and it essentially separates the corn stalk from the cobs and keeps the cobs. The cobs are our fuel of choice for our thermal biomass. We have a local contract with a farmer and he supplies the cobs to us. Uh, we use those in our, in our heating and cooling. Uh, next slide. So what, what do we really look like in our, in our thermal operations, in our electrical operations? We have a, a, a pie chart that has lots of, and if you can see this clearly enough, the WT1 and WT2 are the two wind turbines. We also have a combined heat and power, so we run a steam turbine. Uh, we do purchase grid power. Uh, we have oil backup on our natural gas boilers. And you can see on the other side of the pie chart, we have biomass and natural gas. Now that was last year's operation. Hopefully this year, I'm gonna, we hope to see this invert so that we will be 40% biomass and 23% natural gas. That's our goal. Um, but what you can see is we have multiple energy sources coming from multiple areas and it quickly, um, it didn't take us long to understand that microgrids were going to have to be an essential part of what we have developed as a distributed generation. Uh, without the capability of understanding where our energy is coming from and how to manage it, uh, we simply couldn't operate. So uh, next slide, please. Just to put to rest some issues or concerns that, you know, we have uh, essentially natural gas is inexpensive right now, and I think everyone knows that. But uh, things that we just have to live with from the standpoint that even though gas might be $3 per million BTU at the Henry Hub, uh, I don't know anyone who buys all their gas on the spot market. Uh, we do hedge gas purchases, and so that means for last year, our actual purchase price with transportation for gas was about five dollars per million, five point seven dollars per million BTU, which is still a pretty good price. I've heard lots of, well, this you know biomass can't possibly compete with that. Uh, the next bullet down on corn cobs. That's uh, I thought I would put these numbers up here just because the eighty-seven eighty-seven is what we pay per dry ton in terms of million BTUs. And our actual cost is right on par with our gas prices. The advantage is that we now spend in a 40 mile radius of our campus money that used to be spent on natural gas that went somewhere else. So um, even, even with low natural gas prices, the combined heat and power options are still viable options. Uh, I'm gonna, next slide please. As Kent mentioned earlier, certainly conservation um, is, is a big piece of this. Um, we started with approximately 10 million kilowatt hours of electricity. Uh, since 2002, we've reduced our grid demand by 50%. I think you can see the numbers there. Now, that isn't all conservation. That's called adding wind turbines into the mix. And those wind turbines are what we call behind the meter. The power comes to us first, and if we don't use it, then it goes to the grid. So there are actual there are, there are there are fiscal advantages of this, and really the the spread between what we used to be spending for grid power versus what we're spending now becomes the financing mechanism for uh, installing the wind turbines. The, the second wind turbine is a completely self-supporting 
think of it as a, as a very tall um, uh, housing complex. Uh, and so it generates its own revenue and pays its own bond debt and provides us uh, power at the same time. Next slide, please. Next slide, are we there? Well, it's not there on mine either, if you can hear Sarah. Uh, Sarah. Can we move ahead? Again, production. Uh, it's hard to verbally describe this, but it, it's an impressive fact that we're producing far. There we go. Thank you. Um, we're producing far more power than we're using. The actual blue lines are the production from the wind turbines. And at a glance, you can see why wind turbines sometimes cause the utilities headaches, because they have to balance this. Um, that straight line across would be a, the 1,000 kilowatt hour use. And down at the bottom of the chart, anytime that red line is on the bottom, uh, it basically says the campus is using no power off the grid. The impact, though, is in the middle of that graph, you see these peaks that are either red or green. When they're green, it says we're just simply using the wind turbine power. When they're red, it says we're back on the grid using grid power. And so those peaks, uh, we are thinking about as it relates to our renewable generation and microgrids play a big role in understanding that. Next slide, please. This is a simple graph because one of the things we said, well, with those peaks, what happens? We currently are on a large general service, so we pay a flat rate all across the day and the night. And so we asked ourselves, well, what would happen if we went to time of use charges? And our utility does offer those options for us. And so we overlaid um, a, a year's worth of our electrical use on flat charges versus time of use. And we're pleasantly surprised to see the red bars are the time of use. And we're really not much different than what we would be with and at that point in time, we were making not a lot of effort to do load shedding or demand management. Next slide, please. The other piece of the understanding is remember that high production of the wind turbines, the blue lines, lining up our renewable energy generation with our campus loads proved to be very tricky. Wind in itself is a resource that is very abundant in the evenings. But as you look at this graph, its availability at 12 noon is essentially not meeting our needs. And so that really raised the question of, OK, how do we be more strategic in looking at how we manage our generation, our distributed generation, and it really figure out how to store electricity, which right now is not a viable option for us. We need to figure out how to produce electricity, produce electricity during peak demands and cost times. And the intuitive answer here is we need to understand how to be more strategic in our distributed generation. And if we were to start over again, we would look at a more strategic balance between wind and PV. And then certainly the other one is to reduce electric usage to cut demand, which is what microgrids can help us do. Uh, next slide, please. We also looked at, well, if we shifted, if we, can, if we can shift loads and reduce demands, what would it do for us? We calculated it based on um, uh, the red lines are totally not realistic, because that said we're going to shift all our use to the lowest possible time of use rate, which we can't do. But the blue line is 
period down. And that probably is realistic, or at least a, a good goal to shoot for. And you can see that if we can hit those kinds of parameters, there's 15 to 20, maybe even 25 percent reduction in energy costs if we can move that direction. Next slide, please. So oh, smart grids, that was uh, the outcome of how do we now manage this somewhat complex energy production system with the investor-owned utility. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to cite some recent uh, data coming out, and basically what this says is the utilities are going to get very serious about uh, advanced metering and very serious about demand response programs. And uh, another study on the probably the IT segment of advanced communications and energy management is going to account for very large growth areas in the management of our conventional energy systems. And then a much more somber note in the third bullet is uh, we passed a very significant number this last week in terms of CO2 parts per million. Next slide. So that basically said if we have all of these potential issues facing our use of power and when we use power, how do we move to what I would say the next generation of energy management? And to us, it's uh, a solution that says we have to involve our consumers. So we have to provide feedback. We have to provide what I would call uh, assisted meter management on both sides of this meter, not only on the residential or, or the, the user side, but also on the production and grid side. And so we need meters that understand how to talk both ways and that's kind of the strategy that we're thinking about. Next slide, please. This is, and I apologize if you cannot read this on your screens, but this is, uh, again, thinking about where do we go and how do we move from here. We think that we need to understand how to capture our energy, move it into the cloud, and then from there have it retrieved back to consumers, users, uh, managers, uh, or production systems so that we have this kind of universal information system that all parties can look at and understand what can happen. The issues that we know that are out there right now, and I think Honeywell is doing a good job of working on these, is most of our traditional building control systems are BACnet systems or BACnet compatible. As we talk about bringing this information to our consumers, what it means to me is we have to communicate to them in the language that they use, and that is smartphones. And so we have to understand how to get to that open architecture, web-based kind of environment from our current standards right now of um, BACnet proprietary uh, control systems. And, and I'll, I'll give you the layman's interpretation of where we are right now is we have traditional control systems that are run by servers and they manage the building and really the owner in terms of managing those servers. And I think where we are going to end up is some combination of that but much more in a distributed control at IP addresses. In other words, each IP address that we assign is a control point, and that IP address will have its embedded operational instructions. And who has access to that IP address? Anyone you want. It could be the building operator. It could be the building occupants. And we think that that's the way to get the real-time information to the consumers so when they leave their energy systems on, they understand that they'll get feedback that says you used X number of kilowatts last hour and the price is. So we think we need to get much more sophisticated in conveying that information back to the end user. 
learning how to build a bridge between BACnet and, and web interfaces. Last slide, please. So from a 40,000 foot view of managing energy, what we think we need to do is have essentially bi-directional controllers that work with the utility as much as they work with us. And I think Honeywell will talk a little bit more about this on how they see that working where the utility can actually ask us to produce power for them. Um, <clears throat> and so what we think is that we need to continue working on this intelligent kind of control system that really serves both the investor-owned utility and the campus. And with that, I will stop. Thanks. Oh, I have one more slide. Ultimately, the campus is thinking about sustainability, and find sustainability is uh, local jobs, local economy, local resources. There, now I'll stop. <laughs> well, Thanks. Paul, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to transition now to Bill Taylor to help go through the White Oak campus story. So, Bill, if you're there, why don't you take it? I'm here, Kent. White Oak is, is the local name for the Federal Drug Administration's research facility in Silver Springs, Maryland. It is a campus-like setting they have, and they're continuing to build it out. I think it's going over, I don't know, 3 million square feet, 3.5 million square feet by the end of the year, I think, is where it's headed. It originally started out with about 26 megawatts of a central utility microgrid. We it, Basically, what that does... <sighs> It generates power, it generates steam, it generates hot water, so it's actually a combined cycle, combined heat and power system that provides those utilities, if you will, to the, to the entire White Oak campus. It is a fully integrated plant controls with the building automation systems. That's what, that's what BAS stands for. Um, integrated to the point where they have gone through the local load control, like I talked about in the first of the, one of the four steps of the microgrid itself down to what loads are critical. If the power goes out and you have to do a black star, which means there are you, you're coming up from for basically no power, what loads do you have to bring on first? Well, one of the ones they cited was, it was the elevator system. So you could evacuate people from the third and fourth floors of this facility out of a building in case of an emergency. So they went to life safety and then they started going down from there. There are certain parts of the campus that can never go dark. Um, never lose power, so there are there are some hot spring reserves there all the time, and those are some of the complicated experiment, experiments that, experiments that are going on that have taken years to develop, and losing power could start over again. So that was one of the main reasons why White Oak went in this direction. Keep on, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, you can see the campus in the upper right hand side. Um, it is it is sprawling. I'm trying to think. We're we're kind of in the back left, kind of back center area. We wanted to make sure that we provided energy security and energy surety to, to the White Oak facility. That means is that they had control over their power. That that particular, and we'll get into this in, in another slide in a minute. Over the last 18 months, at in near in the vicinity near Silver Springs, Maryland, through the storms that came through through couple of hurricanes, a couple of bad snowstorms, some local tornadoes, severe thunderstorms, the local residents around White Oak have lost power to a total, I think, of 26 times. During those same 18 months, White Oak has never lost power. The microgrid monitors continually the grid function and also will monitor the weather. If they see a storm front coming, they'll switch to island mode manually. Every two cycles of our 60 cycle power system, they're sampling the grid. If the grid looks unstable, the campus goes into island mode automatically with no human intervention. They're always, always looking. The other thing is the, the you took the other bullets, just go over them quickly. The energy efficiency and renewable energy mandates from the government are, talks to another part of what we talked about in the four steps of microgrid, the energy efficiency. It's an ongoing program of White Oak, so we minimize how much power we actually generate. And at, right now, their building's coming online, their latest one which we're supplying power and steam and hot water to, I believe chilled water as well, comes online, I think, this fall. However, as with all of this, there is a budget constraints. We had to balance the, the conflicting needs of budgets versus what campus wanted. 
and also there was an aging infrastructure around utility, which is very common in the, in the Northeast Corridor. Next slide. There was an optimization of this power plant and of the, of, of the facilities that was built up for White Oak. The initial strategy was near continuous operation of a one engine generator, sound one reciprocating engine. That has evolved to over the years to a real time make or buy decision. And it really is real time based on the cost of natural gas, electric tariffs, campus loads, engine and co, and co generation efficiencies. What can they do with that? What makes the best sense for GSA, the, the government services agency that actually owns White Oak? That is going on in the background at all times. What happened as part of this, uh, you just heard a little talk about an intelligent util utility. This allowed us to expand our, our, our auto load shed scheme. How can we get rid of power when we need to? How do we bring down and, and limit peak demand? We added dual fuel generation assets. So if we have a single point of failure in the, in the gas lines, we now have diesel backup. Combined heat and power reduces your carbon footprint more. Typical generator sets are going to be in the 35 each category. Thermal efficiency, when you do CHP and you actually use the steam, when the hot water that's produced, it goes up to 65 to 75 percent. So you've increased the thermal efficiency, you've wrung more BTUs out of that particular cubic foot of gas. Part of what was also referred to or set up earlier was there's an interconnect agreement with the utility. Not only can we island, and I'll go to this in another slide, we also been supply of power back to them on those hot, humid summer days when everybody's got their air conditioners on and the grid is having troubles keeping up. White Oak can expand, uh, put on all of its power and start to supply it back to the grid. Next slide, please. Innovative solutions that have been applied to White Oak combined heat and power I talked about to the point where just to, just to comment on that for a minute, it's not just that we're using the, the heat and say we're going to use it for heat with an absorption chiller. They determined that it would be better you know, efficiency economically to run that steam in the summertime through a steam turbine, generate electricity, and run high efficiency electrical chillers instead. They have the option to do both, but that has now been brought online as a way to make sure that they're getting the most squeezing every possible BTU they can out of every nickel they spend. We are bringing up our standard into the new buildings. They are constructing that to the point where they're tying into the circuit breaker level for building load control. Um, I know in some campuses this is mandatory for near, in, in, particularly out in California, where you bring in and, re and renovate a system, you put in the smart circuit breakers. This is being done on White Oak and integrated back through the building management system, back to the microgrid management system. Chilled water, interesting, long, real happy. They suddenly, the water main in the street near White Oak broke. They had no cooling, cooling water for their turbines. That resulted in a 2 million gallon thermal storage facility of chilled water, which also doubles as backup cooling water for the turbines and the other facilities there in the power generation system. Automated demand response, we also do that. If we need to shed load, we'll shed load. By shedding load there at White Oak, though, we'll take it off the grid. We'll pick it up in with the own generation site instead. So we'll transition that as well. We are in the process of adding biofuels to our capabilities so the biodiesel can run there. And, and that's going on in, in, as natural gas prices increase. It also gives a greener component. So it's all being melded together there in one location. Next slide, please. Okay, reliability metrics. This says uptime over the last than five nines. Um, that's true. I don't, to my knowledge, we haven't lost power there at White Oak for over 24 months. In other words, there's no part of it that's gone dark without it being under our control. Redundancy, we provide a redundancy in all systems. Like I said earlier, one of the main criteria for White Oak was that certain experimental labs could never, ever lose power. There's always hot spinning reserves so that if there's ever any fluctuation in the power grid or there's loss of power that we didn't anticipate, those facilities are powered first. Life safety is also brought online. Island mode, it's, it's there. We've, we've islanded it automatically or manually at 50 times over the past two and a half years. I, I can tell you from having been there with it when a storm front was advancing that, that I was in a conference room working on the Wi-Fi, having a meeting, and one of the conference rooms there, they came back and they said, we just switched to island mode. The lights didn't flicker. The um, Wi-Fi never interrupted. 
it, it was it was absolutely seamless. Um, it was very impressive to watch it do it, do it that seamlessly and that smoothly. In the last two and a half years, that's an impressive number where they just haven't gone dark. Power generation. This was alluded to earlier. On a yearly basis, there's I, I didn't really there's more power supplied to Pepco, the local supplies to the White Oak campus. When they need new generation, they need to help bring their grid back up online after a power outage, White Oak is there and they bring up their full generation capacity. I said earlier it's 26 megawatts. That's where it's at now. By the end of 2013, they'll bring on the other uh, not quite 30 megawatts of power up to 55 total megawatts. One more slide. I think there's one more, right? Maybe. Next slide, please. There we go. Annual benefits. You can, just, you can read through this uh, on the annual savings. Um, under construction, we're, we're saving, uh, we've been reduced 30% of the baseline on annual, annual energy. They removed 50,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. That's a equivalent of about 15,000 cars removed from the road. Um, we have reduced the, the demand the savings, about $3 million is from the cogeneration. And the rainwater, we've also harvested the rainwater for, for making up water for the cooling towers themselves. I, is there one more? I think there is, but I'm not sure. Next slide. Ah, smart grid applications. Okay. Bill, if I could add a couple of comments on Please. that. We talked about the four steps of microgrid, of a smart microgrid, traditional energy efficiency improvements, on-site generation, implementing advanced controls, and operating with the util with, you know, within the utility grid or in an island mode. And clearly, White Oak has got all those. I don't know if Bill mentioned it, but our, our involvement in this has been really at all four phases of that. Oh, honey well here. But one of the neat things is, I always told the story, I went in one time at midnight to meet the shift that worked the late, the late shift, and in there was one of our best engineers, you know, working with a guy, and, and the ability to, to just really understand everything going on at that facility is, to me, what makes it really special. And, and I think about, you know, Hurricane Sandy, when they built this facility, microgrid was, was a thought, but what's really getting the attention within DOD is the, is the microgrid results now. So we're getting more interest at this facility for microgrid than we are for anything else in the last year, which I find you know, very, very interesting. So thanks, Bill, and let's, let's go to Pete. Pete? Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank uh, Kent and Sarah for help uh, coordinating this, and, and also to um, uh, Bill and Lowell for your uh, thoughtful presentations about microgrids. Uh, I find this presentation, quite frankly, uh, uh, interesting in its timing in that uh, yesterday, uh, we, it was our 30th uh, year, uh, 30 years ago, that a tornado went through the zoo, killed several people, and, and thankfully didn't do much to our campus 30 years ago. But I find uh, the interesting timing of talking about this, of, of uh, bad weather. Also, it's an interesting timing to talk about uh, utility infrastructure across the United States within the Midwest region, in particular Michigan. We do know the infrastructure is aging. We know it needs renewal. We know they're behind on renewing the infrastructure. And to no surprise, I, I would assume those listening from higher education that the demands of your institutions have not changed. They still want to have high reliability. And as we're more involved into uh, higher research, as you can see in this slide, we are considered by the Carnegie, Carnegie Institute a doc high research institution. The institution really demands high reliability. So a little more about Western. You can see the size of our campus. We're not the smallest. We're not the largest. I think we're the right size, about 25,000. Uh, a little more than 100 years old. We do house quite a few students. Um, a pretty good sized campus of one more than 150 buildings, and our facilities department has about 500 full time employees. Our central heat power plant, uh, as you can see, uh, we have on our campus. I'd like to shift over right now to our sustainable points of pride. Uh, I'm sure every uh, person listening here has some bragging points about your institution, but just a few I'd like to kind of hit on here that uh, you can see. Uh, while we uh, have decreased energy in the last almost 20 years by 17%, our campus has been growing by just about 19%. And we've done a lot of unique things I'll share with you about that. We do have 21 EV charging stations across our campus. Uh, we are Cree, Cree Campus USA ever since they started that in 2008. Um, Princeton Review has recognized our institution. Um, and one of the key things here you'll see that we eliminated 
coal back in 1999, and that was kind of a big shift heading toward a combined heat and power plant solution that's been on board now for quite a bit of time. Uh, we have a recycling coordinator. We're into lead for several, uh, seven of our buildings, and we do have claim to fame of the first lead EV gold in higher education in the world. Uh, we've been aggressively pursuing water reduction by 50% of our water consumption is down, and we've uh, totally eradicated our incandescent lamps across the entire campus. Next slide. And uh, we uh, do have the uh, first uh, student sustainability fee in the state of Michigan. We're one of 15 independent universities. Our president, like perhaps many listening in, have also been signatories uh, to the president's commitment. Um, he, our president has also signed the Telwar Declaration. Our president's engaged with the local mayors in Southwest Michigan for a regional sustainability covenant. Uh, we were engaged in the Billion Dollar Green Challenge, and perhaps some people listening are all. So a part of the Green Challenge, briefly in my presentation, um, and the Sustainable Down Institute has recognized us. So well, these are one of the four items, and we go to the next slide here, traditional efficiency improvements, and those are one of the four things that Ken talked about. And, uh, and this is probably something that uh, is, is so important about microgrids is that you've got to lower the consumption as much as humanly possible. And our tact here, of course, is focusing on GHG emissions, and this is our trajectory that our institution has been focusing on now for some time. And uh, you can see where we're headed. We're making progress uh, early on. And uh, with that, that's as to why we will want to lower our consumption, which of course supports a smaller microgrid. Next slide. So how have we gone about energy consumption reduction? Um, and what are some of uh, This is a, a really impressive slide. The vertical bars indicate our square footage as we've grown over the last couple of decades. And the green uh, graph, or green line on the graph, is one that's going down over the last couple of decades and that's our energy consumption going down. And had we not taken a tact of energy reduction some 20 years ago, as you can tell, we've been in this business of reducing consumption for quite some time. The red line is what our projections would have been had we not done anything with energy conservation. So this graph here pretty much tells a story of how we've increased the size of our campus while decreasing energy consumption. Next slide. And part of that story uh, is, is nothing uh, uh, fabulous. Many people across campus are focused on USGBC and, and new construction, but our focus at Western, actually the picture in the upper, upper, upper left-hand corner, uh, is about LEED EV. And uh, that is our first LEED EV. That's a green, uh, excuse me, that is a gold level LEED EV done several years ago. And since then, we have another three more EV buildings that have been certified. There's so much opportunity for getting certification in existing buildings. The lower right hand corner is our latest $70 million education and college building that uh, everything that we do for new construction is lead silver minimum. And actually the one in the lower right hand corner, we just opened up and ended up being a lead goal. So new construction and lead EV has been part of our strategy for lowering consumption across our campus. Next slide. Also on energy conservation, there's so much more, and these are things that everyone uh, obviously is doing. Uh, lighting upgrades, the LEDs, compact fluorescents, the T8s, the T5s, and done a lot with occupancy uh, daylight controls also. And then campus-wide initiatives, uh, we have our energy control center that has a very firm temperature set point policy on our holidays here in northern uh, uh, parts of the United States of Michigan here. We do save a lot of energy on holidays by bringing our buildings back to a much lower temperature. And a lot of the traditional things of Energy Star purchasing, our climate save savers initiative with our computing that we have. And retro commissioning is huge on our campus that has saved quite a bit over the last several years. And lastly is tracking and, and uh, monitoring our utilities. And this is a typical, not a bill, but something we send to all of our 150 building uh, coordinators in each building. 
We have sub metering for all of our buildings, and we do track monthly consumption. We email that to make and where they're at, where they're going with consumption, so they get some buy-in also for this process of them participating and conserving energy. Next slide. Billion Dollar Green Challenge is something that perhaps some people listening in are participating in. If not, it's a pretty simple program. We identify some energy waste on campus, you finance it with some upfront money, and then you take the money that you save in that process to reinvest it. So it's a cyclical account, and we've had this account now for almost 18, 19 years. And when the uh, Green Challenge came around, our president uh, threw in some money into that, so we've uh, advanced that process of investing more in energy conservation. And quite frankly, um, we've been doing this, like I say, for almost 20 years on our own, and we needed some help recently, so we engaged Honeywell through a performance contract. Right now, they're halfway through a near $3 million uh, project with us. I think it's like 28, 27 different projects across campus for more energy conservation opportunities. Next slide. Behavior change is big since we've been at this game, and I think a lot of people listening in have been at the cons energy conservation game for a long time, that uh, the final frontier is behavior change. Um, and so we're actually partnering with Honeywell right now of putting up some kiosks within several of our buildings, and a PhD student on our campus is uh, working with uh, Honeywell in order to collect that data to find out statistically what kinds of behavioral changes are there with kiosks and dashboards across campus. We're looking forward to a year or so from now presenting some of that to our colleagues across the United States. Next slide. On-site generation storage capacity. Uh, that's the second piece that Ken talked about. A little bit about utility distribution. As you can see on this map, uh, we have in GIS all this in of nearly 49 miles of utilities that we own, operate, and maintain on our campus. Next slide or next uh, forward. And our exist distribution, as you can see, is 75 million uh, kWh for electricity and about a half a billion pounds of steam is our typical load across campus. And uh, we certainly have had seen uh, some good changes with that as time has, has gone on. Next slide. On the power generation, uh, that's our power plant that has been transformed uh, almost a decade and a half ago and that uh, we uh, put in a cogeneration system at that plant, so it's now 100% uh, gas-fired, um, no longer coal. We have two uh, cogeneration gas turbines for a total of uh, 10 megawatts from those. We do also have about a half meg black start and a steam turbine for megs, so about to almost 12 megawatts of power that we can generate. Um, that's a typical graph you can see on the right-hand side that is typical of a cogeneration. But you can certainly see we're producing over 90% of the campus electricity, 100% of the steam. And for those other uh, boilers, you can click one more, please, Lord. That you can see that uh, we have replaced all of our older uh, coal boilers that were transferred to gas to all new gas boilers to supplement our combined heat and power plant. And big thing here I want to mention to everyone, I suspect that some people that are still burning coal, that was one of the key things that made us move forward to an all-gas plant great opportunity to look at a cogen plant and going from coal to natural gas, we have reduced our CO2 emissions from eight, up to 87 percent. And it's just an incredible number to see that kind of reduction when we uh, eliminate an old coal plant. Next slide. Utility meters, uh, you can't uh, look performance until you measure things. So. Over the last, actually, 10 years, we've been putting lots of meters in. As you can see, we have a total of 714 meters across our campus. And so submetering and connecting this data and doing something with the data is terribly important. And so that just gives the context of the different types of meters that we have on our campus. Next slide. This is probably one of the most important charts here that's related to this presentation. You can see our generation. And we've been doing some unique things at our power plant to increase reliability, increase the generation with our equipment. With that, of course, you see the middle of the slide, we're purchasing less. And with our increased generation, we're also having opportunities to export. And so we're certainly not quite there. Um, some parts of the day we can be an island, but uh, 
course, we're looking at opportunities to uh, find that sweet spot of trying to keep our turbines running uh, most of the time. These turbines obviously cannot be turned on and off. Uh, they have to run continuously for a long period of time. But uh, at the end of the day, you can see that uh, we are handling quite a bit of our own generation. And even with some export, we are doing a good job of trying to control our destiny of being on our own microgrid, if you will. Next slide. Also, with the uh, some potential for generation in storage, not there's a lot of storage and, and some batteries in a few cars, but um, we do have a unique uh, project that we just finished last year with the Clean Energy Coalition here in Michigan. Uh, this was a $750,000 grant, which uh, does have a combination of there's 15 uh, EV charging stations and a 50 uh, kVA uh, grid there, solar grid. And so we put these together to have people see that you can put your electric vehicles next to the charging station, next to the PV arrays. And this is heavily used across our community. And in the forefront, you can see some of the vehicles on the right-hand side. Kent, is that your car on the left-hand side, by the way? I don't know. The big one, the big one, the big one, the big one is me. Yeah, the red one. Next slide, please. And just a couple of quick shots that uh, we, of course, since we have this 50 kVA uh, grid, that uh, PV array that we have there, this is some screenshots coming out. We can determine through the inverters of each of the panels how we're doing. Uh, next slide. So it gives us that import uh, criteria and information. Our electric vehicle deployment. Um, we do have five of these Azure Transit Connects. You've seen a lot of the Transit Connect type vehicles left-hand side. This is 100% all electric vehicle. And uh, we can take it down the road doing 75 miles an hour on the interstate here. And, uh, and it's the same chassis, same body as the Transit Connects, which is the most popular service vehicle. We also have a new heat and transmission uh, hybrid aerial lift truck. We have some other the hybrid SUVs. Next slide. And charging infrastructure, I mentioned we have 21 charging stations. There's 15 on the left hand, the middle slide, and we also have six other charging stations across campus. And that has proved to be a very helpful item as well as heavily used across our campus of late. Next slide. And of course, this is all tied to uh, a national system. You can see the uh, Michigan map where there are charging stations and because we do have those uh, 21 units here, and you can see circle the lower left-hand corner, Southwest Michigan, where we're located, that uh, we do spike up quite a bit to be one of the larger uh, areas that have a lot of charging stations in Southwest Michigan. Of course, you can see Detroit on the other side. Uh, we even have almost as many as downtown Detroit, which is the capital of the auto industry. Next slide. And we do also have data that comes out of the charging stations of how much we're consuming out of those charging stations. And it's important that we uh, continue to track this for our federal grant that we got out of this, Recharge Point America. Next slide. And while um, Bill really talked a little bit about wind and his neck of the woods, uh, you saw in Southwest Michigan, we're really not along the shoreline, and neither do we have lots of wind in Southwest Michigan. But we do have a small wind turbine on our campus. It's uh, Dr. John Patton here with his uh, uh, EV vehicle tied into the parking deck. And that wind turbine in the upper part of this is actually producing electricity for his vehicle at the engineering campus. Next slide. The other renewable energy, which was part of what uh, Kent and others are mentioning, we do have three different areas where we do have uh, PV arrays. This is our first one we did about eight, nine, ten years ago. That's a small 12 uh, PWH system on top of our one of our buildings. Next slide. And here's that 50 uh, KWH system over by uh, one of our parking decks that we saw already. And next slide. And this is a building uh, that we just completed, and these panels are being installed right now. There's a picture of our president and a couple of the construction workers putting on uh, almost 1,000 panels on top of this brand new building roof, which uh, is about a quarter megawatt of power. So total, we're just under a third of megawatt of uh, solar power, which is part of our renewable energy. We're working with one of our newer projects right now for a 
geothermal system as part of our renewable portfolio. Certainly not a huge quantity in our campus, but yet it's part of our portfolio, part of our goals for trying to be more independent off of the main grid. Next slide. Implement advanced controls. Um, we are very blessed with the energy control center. This is uh, in the building I'm in right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is uh, a, a area of our, uh, uh, our physical plant system where we have uh, monitoring and controlling over 100,000 points over those 150 some odd buildings. Uh, it's not staffed 24 7, but it's staffed uh, first shift and a good portion of second shift when we do have most of our campus active and the other times we auto page data out. And so that is our control center as part of our solution for limiting energy. And this is a unique project. We do have a natatorium on our campus, an Olympic sized pool, and we also have an excellent Division I hockey team which is in the same building. So half the building is a large sheet of ice, the other half of the building is an Olympic sized swimming pool. And about 15 years ago, we created this system, taking the heat out of the process of making ice for the large sheet of ice, and we're heating our Olympic sized swimming pool. And since we've done that uh, over a decade ago, we have not used one pound of steam, zero and other end forms of energy in order to heat that pool. And so it's part of, again, these solutions that we're working together on. The last item here was operating with the utility grid or in an island mode. That was the fourth piece that Ken talked about. This is my last slide, and uh, we're using this control center for monitoring our import and export and generation. We do some weather forecasting in this area. There are weekly meetings to talk about the weather, whether it's sub-zero, or in the upper 90, over 100 degree temperatures. We have different protocols. We do have some load shedding going on. It's very difficult in universities to shed load, but we found uh, it to be important for us is to cycle our chillers. We are dense, decentralized chillers multiple plants and we can actually cycle those off for one to two hours a piece. We would do a mass energy uh, temperature setting, a lowering or raising depending upon the extreme temperatures we're having, especially in the summertime when we would have higher peak costs for electricity for the times we're importing. We do have a mercy uh, load shed protocol if things get as bad enough as it, if it is that we would end up sh uh, shedding uh, some of our energy for certain kinds of buildings. We have uh, decentralized emergency generators that we can automatically turn on from this location, although we do have to monitor emissions from that. Some of you on campuses, you know, it sounds good to do these things, but we have emission issues that we have to report. Uh, we do have the power plant uh, circuit switch protocols if we do have to shut off a circuit a part of our campus. Obviously, high research and housing is high on the reliability list that we would leave on. We have a power plant that does make by decisions for our natural gas based upon consumption and protocols. We do have an interconnect agreement with Consumers Energy, our local utility company. And no, we're not fooled. Uh, someday we're going to work hopefully with Honeywell to consider uh, fully automating some of these operations. But this control center uh, is done with a lot of data and a lot of human intervention. But uh, it's worked well for us for now, for almost a decade that this center has been in place. And with that, I'll go to the next slide and turn it back over to Kent. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, Bill Taylor is going to bring us home real quickly so we can get to the Q&A uh, with the key elements for what we consider successful microgrids. So, Bill? Yeah, just building off of that, and again, mindful of the time, we're a little bit over. <clears throat> The, the key elements that, that we look at are the advanced controls. Uh, we have to control not just the, the generation but the load in the building so that everything matches and you can move the loads as you need to. Distributed generation, we're going to move the distributed generation allows you to bring generators on one side of the campus actually online through the microgrid control system and actually power building somewhere else if it needs more power than that generator is using locally. So you're allowed to mix and match um, whether it's CHP whether it's a turbine, whether it's a diesel, even your PV can be online during the power outage once you're separated from the grid, and the microgrid controls will manage that power as well. The, it, like I said, distributed generation, but also alternate generation, energy efficiency is a big part of this. You don't want to pay for more generation than you need. You would like to make sure your buildings are as efficient and your processes are as efficient as possible. 
The microgrid technology is available now, and it's maturing very, very rapidly. White Oak's been in the development for several years. It's fully operational. It is being added to. We've learned a lot from that, as well as as well as provided a lot of savings there to the federal government. But it can be it can be built up in stages. It can be do one part of the of the four at a time, if you wish. It doesn't need to be an all or nothing. You can you can take a long term view of this and 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 see where you want to go with a vision to build out of how to automate it, how to bring in the efficiencies, how to bring on the generation. There are three basic questions you're going to need to answer before you deploy a microgrid. Is your current is your current power distribution system on campus and locally? Is it adequate for future growth? I, could, I, I live in Connecticut, based in the Northeast. We've been out of power here a lot in Connecticut. I can say that the power system here is not robust enough to really facilitate large economic growth in the area on campuses or elsewhere. There needs to be an investment. One of the other speakers mentioned that the utility infrastructure needs to be upgraded and it has not been. That's a question. A microgrid will actually reinstall the switch gear, will reinstall some of the power lines on your campus. Does it make financial sense to build, operate, and maintain a microgrid? This is something you can either have to contract out for or, or do your or do yourself with with a trained crew. Does it make financial sense to do that? And finally, the question I always ask at most of the end of my presentations is, what's the cost of doing nothing? If you do nothing and you're hit with a natural disaster where the, where the, where the power's down, say like Katrina, what happens to your campus and what happens to your students? The power's out for a long period of time. What do you do with that? And where do you go from that? Next slide. Four steps. This, again, just kind of reiter reiterating one more time, the traditional efficiency improvements are, are, are what you would normally think of as performance contracting of the energy efficiency, infrastructure upgrades, boilers, chillers, buildings, et cetera. The on-site generation, uh, generation and storage, the implementation of advanced control <laughs> is critical because you want the buildings to interact with the microgrid. The microgrid will put power where you need it, not necessarily where it's being generated. And you want to be able to operate with the utility grid or in island mode. And, and again, that's a key point. Next slide, please. As we've gone through the microgrids and built them up at, at White Oak and other locations around the world, we've started to understand and learned a few lessons along the way, as you can imagine. A microgrid is going to move power around. It's not you can have five generators at local buildings, but if they're connected to a microgrid, they will power a building that they're not connected to. They'll be connected through the microgrid utility system. Backup generation is going to typically be for a building or a couple of buildings, and it's going to come on from a black start. And you, could not, you may or may not have much load control over that. Microgrid is going to do all of those things. The economics are something that's going to be unique for every situation. It's something that needs to be understood, both not just the initial investment, but the long-term payout, 1, 5, 10, 15 years in advance or in the future, and you're going to want to look at what you want to do with that in the future, where you want to build out to. Um, CHP is, is something I preached every every time we look at a, at a microgrid, I, I go CHP. Can we use the heat? Can we use excess heat for something? How do we make this more efficient? Lower your carbon emissions, your overall footprint. One point, microgrids aren't for everybody. If it's really only for backup generation and load shedding, okay, maybe it's more than you want to spend. Um, then the controls are going to be costly. I wouldn't say costly, but they're going to be, it gets in the financial analysis. Consider the impact of all the utilities, not just electricity. You got your water, natural gas, you have chilled water, steam, etc. You got to look at all of those. The managed critical and non critical loads, I, I like to put those in life safety formats. Which ones are the most critical? You actually create a hierarchy. These are my most critical, I can't lose these. These come back on first. What's the safety aspects? Which ones have to come back first? Which ones can come back on later? And which ones don't have to come back on at all until the grid's back? The skill level for to maintain and operate a microgrid is fairly high. So there needs to be some training. There needs to be some expectations around that. Sophisticated controls really are required. And not just in, in the buildings. Those exist. They all exist. But the microgrids themselves are going to be very, very fast. And they will be on a, on a secure grid, typically fiber optics. And you want to keep it as simple as possible from a security standpoint. You don't want to put this out on the web. You want to have localized. 
If you want to put the microgrid data out on the grid, you bring it out to a secure computer and put that computer back on the grid when they can't get back to the grid controls themselves. Next slide, please. And just in, in the, the microgrid has a lot of capabilities. Um, just very quickly, as you go throughout from a microgrid hub, you can impact all of these. You can integrate renewables, um, fuel optimization, energy surety, storage, utility plants, smart grids, all become part of how these can operate and what they can benefit your campus on. Kent, I'm going to turn it back over to Q&A session now uh, and let people bring up their questions. So I know we're a little bit over time. All right. Thank you, everybody. With that, we'd like to turn it to Sarah to drive the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Great presentations. If you have any questions now, submit them in the GoToWebinar question feature. We have a couple that have come in throughout the presentation. So I'll get us started with a general one for uh, Kent and Bill just about scale. So this is a good wrap up from the, the summary that Bill just did. H how does the scale of both the local grid, but, but more importantly, the campus affect your decision to implement a microgrid. So for instance, is, is there a case to be made for this being more beneficial for a smaller campus or a larger campus, for a more rural campus or an urban campus? I mean, how do you break down sort of the, the types of campuses that this would be most effective for? Uh, I'll lead off with that. I really think it's and I hate to say it's unique. I don't know if there's any one size that fits all. Every situation is going to be different. Every every user's profile is going to be different. Um, a rural campus may not have the ability to expand on, on the utility grid that they'd like to, and maybe they want to grow more. And they may want to look at those distributed generations, which capabilities on campus and feed them back into the utility grid. I can see that fairly readily. Downtown campuses, um, in, in major metropolitan areas may not be able to add new capabilities because they'd have to put a substation there to actually expand it in, an urban, uh, in a city-like setting. We run into that situation where you can't, the, the utility can't supply more power, so how do you do it? You got to build a microgrid, you got to build a distributed generation inside the city with all the concerns that go with that. In the rural setting, you might have access to different fuel sources. Uh, we heard biofuels, uh, biomass fuels earlier. Um, it could be natural gas. You could integrate a portfolio of wind and, and solar out there as well and geothermal and bring all that together through the microgrid control system to run your campus. I, I wish I could tell you there was a one size fits all, but I think the solution set is pretty broad and I think it, it is really customized to every campus situation and really what, what the university sees itself in 5, 10, and 15 years doing to building that infrastructure so they can grow. Kent, anything you can add to that? No, I just say to me it's uh, similar comments on size. To me, it's a lot about location and business uh, concerns. You know, many people that are looking at this are looking at it because of the geography they're in. If you're on, you know, if you're where Pete is, you're probably not thinking about earthquakes. But if you're in California and you know you're, you're concerned with it, you might be thinking better for that reason. If you're in, you know, Louisiana, it's going to be different reasons. So a lot of it to me is about your business case, your your profile of your school, uh, what research is going on there, what are your critical pieces, and I think that's just as important or, or more important sometimes than size. And I think the, the point that Lowell made early in his his presentation with the two circles, you know, he's pretty quickly you know, defining what it was about his campus that made it unique. Uh, that wasn't necessarily size related, it was location and size. Okay, great. So another technical question for the two of you. Uh, how much oversight does DEP and EPA demand for the, the clean air requirements? Uh, I'll take that one real quick. The Everything that we do is, is meets the emission requirements of the locality that we're in, and every state is a little bit different. Um, some are more stringent than the EPA, some are less, but we, we meet those requirements. And you have to get the emissions permit before you start to generate power on a continuous basis, which a lot of what certainly White Oak does. If it's an emergency generator generation type scenario only where you're going to bring on, say, half a dozen generators during a power outage, but you're going to use a microgrid to distribute that power where you need it, it's a different set of requirements. And you basically, you need to meet the local state as well as federal EPA requirements. They don't ask for any special oversight other than what the usual sampling rates are, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, excellent. Okay, um, is it that? No. So I'll direct to the next question to Pete and Lowell from a campus perspective. Um, when you have been looking at, you know, largely the energy management benefits and impacts from a microgrid on your campuses, um, to what extent has that also been a part of your climate action planning process? Um, so I'm combining a couple different questions here, but I think the essence is, oops, sorry, that was a noise on my computer. I think the, the essence of the question is, as you're thinking about disaster planning or future benefits of, of reducing grid instability, is that being incorporated into your, your climate action plan or, or are the two processes really separate, disaster planning and climate action planning? I can jump into our first, uh, that uh, they're all integrated in my mind because if they're really siloed, you really can't move your agenda forward and you've got to uh, attach an agenda, whether it's GHG or, or your disaster recovery type planning, uh, you've got to attach them all together in order to move the Titanic in the direction we need to move it in. And without a doubt, a lot of this microgrid topic, the conversation we're having here has a lot to do with energy, and uh, energy has a lot to do with GHG. And so they're fully integrated in my mind. And there's great opportunities to actually support the microgrid concept by lowering consumption, which is moving toward our GAG goals. And if you're lowering that consumption, your costs are lower for your microgrid. There's less issues to deal with. Uh, so it's, it's all the above, and you've got to mix them together. You work them together, in my mind. Sarah, I would, I would simply echo that. The Morris Energy Plan is Morris's carbon management plan, and they do have to be integrated. And we know from experience that integrating the electrical and the thermal together gets us far more reductions and our greenhouse gas footprints than trying to separate, go independently in either one of them. Great. So another another question for the two of you. Um, to what extent have you either, again, for existing changes that you've made to the campus energy system or planned, to what extent have you um, made an effort to reach out to the surrounding community and the student population or campus community to communicate those changes? And has there been a positive conversation around the switch as it's happened? I could jump in first also on that one, that uh, without a doubt, uh, higher education campuses are more focused on uh, the green agenda on campuses. And because of that, um, they're thirsty to know what's going on. They're intrigued by what's going on. They, they want to be engaged on a campus, uh, not so much with, of course, you know, uh, microgrids, but more into the conservation, more into knowing what we have done on our campus, and especially those things they can see, the solar, the wind projects, the EV projects. Uh, we've even tried to have many students go through a power plant to appreciate what goes on in that power plant for combined heat and power system. Certainly engineering students and sustainability class have gone through but by and large, I think the, the campus community wants to know and wants to be engaged. I would echo that um, an example is our student body president last year whose residence hall was in sight lines of the wind turbines, would get up every morning and look to see if the wind turbines were running. And if they were, he'd tweet out to all his friends, today's a good day to do your laundry. Um, <laughs> so they pay attention, and it's important to them. That's excellent. Um, this, this next question, I think I've, I'll open up to the whole panel. You can choose who might be best to respond to this one. Someone asked about um, current utility generators pushing back against the adoption of individual generation on campus. Has there been any tension between uh, connecting microgrids on campus and uh, you know connecting those back to the local grid or any pushback from utility providers or utility generators about um, kind of coming up with these new innovative solutions on campus? Sir, I can, I can speak from Western Michigan's perspective that uh, our local utility really encourages opportunities, especially in summertime, for our generation to be pushed back when they need it. Um, they even had programs uh, some time ago where they paid us uh, X dollars a year in order to have the capabilities to push our generation back on their grid. Um, but the only caution I have in that whole arrangement is that uh, they are interested in protecting their physical assets 
and so are we interested in protecting our power plant uh, assets in, in, in our power generation system. So that relationship becomes making sure that the right types of technology, the right engineering design is in place. So both parties are protecting their equipment, and if it's not in place, there could be some significant damage created. And so working through those technical details are so important, and both parties usually uh, kind of over-design, if you will, to make sure that their assets are not going to be damaged in that process. We had similar experience where we needed to go through an interconnection uh, study uh, and make sure that all of our power production platforms were essentially compliant with theirs. And then, of course, a long-range 20-year uh, power purchase agreement that allows uh, agreements for us to sell power to the utilities. I would echo both of those comments. What I see is that the utilities want to see a very stringent interconnect agreement, and there's a lot of technology involved in that to make sure that assets on both sides are protected. What I see occasionally, and it really is going to depend on your utility, they view this as, as to some degree as a challenge to them um, because they see the distributed generation somewhat taken away from their own tariffs. And it's going to be really a localized solution. Um, some are more amenable to it than others. Some are going to push back. I think it's workable. We've not found one that won't work with us or work through those issues. But there will be some aspects of that that, that, that will take some discussions with the utilities. Hey, Kent, anything to add? No, let's go, go ahead, sir. Okay, um, Bill, I have a follow-up question, I think, mostly for you. I'm going to actually head back one slide, because I think it's relevant to this lessons learned that you had. Um, you were talking about the controls required and, and skill level, but also earlier in the presentation, you had been talking about um, manage, uh, efficient management. So one of the questions we had was about... Um, the program, have you incorporated dispatch, i.e. the purchasing and selling power in your program that will run on expert systems to maximize the investment in microgrids? Yes, we have. If you if you look at what the White Oak facility is doing now, they look at how to maximize that investment. They do real-time determination of whether or not to, to actually run the, run the generation system or not or to push it out to the grid or to run internally based on time of year, based on time of day, rate tariffs based on the local, what they're paying for natural gas that day. Um, so yeah, we have we have done that. We look to maximize that. There are incorporation of, of different software techniques to, to load shedding, basically demand limiting, if you will. Um, automated demand response is, is if the utility has a real issue, you can switch quickly to island mode, bring more resources back online. There's a lot of things you can do, in, you know, dynamically you can start to dim lights you can depend on how deep your controls go you can start to let your main compressors on your HVAC system start to drift up your main pumps go on to you know variable frequency drives let them slow down a little bit all these things can be managed from an interaction between the microgrid and your building control system ultimately back into the utility grid depending on what kind of interconnect agreement you have with them so the short answer is yes but that's a long explanation Excellent. Excellent. Oh, well, Kent, was that or was that someone chiming in? Okay. Um, so another, I'm gonna, I think, open this one up to the to the full group again. This kind of comes back to this bigger question of how can you tell whether a microgrid is something that would be efficient, effective for your campus? So um, we've touched a little bit on some of the the reasons you know, energy management wise, why a microgrid makes sense, but on a bigger scale, in addition to extreme weather events that might take your campus offline, what are some of the other, you know, maybe regional climate impacts or weather impacts that campuses should be considering when they're thinking about that um, question that Bill posed to us, which is, you know, what's, what's the cost of not doing this in the, in the future? So another one that jumps to mind is in increasing heat pressure on grids. Are there others that campuses should be thinking about locally that would be a, a great impact on their current grid system? Well, Sarah, certainly uh, a lot of us to report to business offices, okay? And there has to be a business model and a lot of times a business decision as to why someone will move in this direction. Um, and, and whether you have a coal plant that, that is, is going to expire or you have 
as a power plant asset that needs to be renewed. Uh, it does beg the question as what options do we have? Cogeneration is, is a piece towards this microgrid conversation we're having. But I think the common denominator here is opportunity based upon an expiring power plant or a major system that needs to be renewed. And a lot of times people, unfortunately, might stick their head in the sand and just go with the same technology. They need to look at options. So opportunities when a large system is renewed or always continue to challenge the, the budget numbers and look at a different mechanism, a different system, a different way of doing business and push the numbers because if the numbers don't work, the whole project will not move forward. And I think we facility office need to constantly I just add that the funding for these projects, and I think I saw a question that was around the funding and you know how do you get the funding, but to me that becomes one of the biggest questions because ultimately this isn't a payback discussion in many cases. It could be a cost avoidance, and so it comes back to that business case of at what price and how fast do you go, and, and, and it's going to be different in all cases, but there are definitely schools that are wrestling with that when at the board of directors or trustees they see that they're they're on to the worry when it comes to spending the money they've got to make those decisions and how those decisions are going to get made you know depends on how much support they can get from grants from from alumni from other places they can get to help with the costs for what ultimately many times is in a payback story Sarah this is Lowell and I would add one more element to that and that's risk mitigation Mm -hmm. uh, understanding what your risks are to do to stay in uh, the current energy markets versus uh, what you might do to stabilize your risk from the and the example I use is the wind turbines uh, we know the cost of the wind turbine production out for 20 years and uh, there are no fuel surcharges on wind so we have a pretty good idea what 70% uh, of our power is going to cost us uh, 15 years from now well, one thing that struck me was when I was driving to your campus, what I saw on the highway. As far as talk about that, that um, sustainable renewable education. Yes, um, it's part of the the mantra of the students understand that we're only in an element of time, and that, and as things change, as we as we understand more our our energy footprints and our environmental issues that we will continue to challenge these students to be creative and to keep thinking about how we manage uh, to preserve our environment and our way of life. I think just to add one aspect to that is that with the data you can collect from microgrid you can also supply that to the students to for their classwork and for advanced degrees and, and Use the microgrid as a living laboratory. You have the ability to bring different generation systems on and off the grid fairly readily. I mean, the switch gear is there. The data they're collecting is there. It's all basically available real time. The command and control would be obviously kept to the, to the director of the facilities and his team. But the learning abilities and the ability to look at the impact on campus of different types, even from a, st even from a study standpoint, bouncing that back off of real data and weather data, creates a learning opportunity that, that can be fairly unique. I can just add one more to that, Mrs. Pete, that uh, we are in the business of, of not maintaining buildings. Our primary mission is educating the next generation of, of uh, individuals. And so while many times I think our business is maintaining, that it's more than just that. And so it's important for us to kind of make sure that we look at the academic uh, aspects of our campus to leverage that. That's the beautiful thing about higher education as a potential customer for everything from energy efficiency to on-site generation to grid is you can't have those same benefits when you go do this at White Oak. As much as it's a campus, at the end of the day, you don't have the student and the faculty piece to leverage, and that's the beautiful thing about a campus. 
Well, I, I couldn't think of a better note to end the presentation on. Certainly, there's we, we got to hear a lot about the benefits of energy management, about disaster planning, all of the, the learning objectives. But I think it's a great way to wrap up the presentation to say that one of the greatest benefits of any of these projects, particularly um, what we covered with microgrids today, is the educational potential for campuses to really be innovation centers for these solutions to really act as uh, one of you just mentioned a, a living laboratory. So congratulations to Minnesota Morris and Western Michigan for being leaders in that area and to all of the PCC campuses who are tuned in today. We're right at 3.30, so I'm going to have us wrap up. Thanks for attending, everyone. Again, the PowerPoint slides and the full presentation recording will be on the ACU PCC website, and you'll also receive an email with that information and links to follow up with anyone from the PowerPoint. Thanks for attending, and have a great afternoon, everyone.